Adam and Eve. You may have heard of these two before. They're a pretty famous couple for the most part. Up there with the likes of Kanye and Kim West, Prince William and the Duchess Kate, your own JCL, Felto, and Ashley. Apart from one another, Adam and Eve are just two semi-popular first names. I know a couple Adams, and I've heard of an Ava at least once in my lifetime. But when put together in the same sentence, Adam and Eve take on a whole new level of intrigue and mystery, for they are the given names of what many in this world believe to be the very first human beings. The very first Imago Dei, creatures made in the image of God, male and female, husband and wife, the original progenitors of the entire human race. Their story begins in the book of Genesis, when the God of the universe sets about making the cosmos and the world we now inhabit. And perhaps their most infamous part of the story, aside from their utter nakedness and living in a paradise of a green garden, is their defiant act against the one who made them. By taking fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they are expelled from God's perfect garden, forced to live a tough and arduous life outside of God's protective canopy, and thus kick-started a ripple effect of sinful, rebellious, and prideful behavior throughout every generation that has followed thereafter. This act is often referred to as the original sin. And it's original sin that remains solely responsible for the state of humanity. Granted, there are contentions of this idea, rooted in other religions, humanist and atheist arguments abounding, yet it seems that we consistently come back to this notion that two people, a man and a woman, can be made accountable for the death and destruction of so many others. It's made me wonder, even as a Christian who believes this story, is that even possible? Or is it even fair to make that assumption? Well, in the latest installment of Netflix's Dark, aka Season 3, its finale season, the German-made sci-fi drama attempts to tackle this issue, albeit in one of the most unique ways I can recently recall. I'm Josh JCL Felto, and this is Episode 70 of The Writer's Lens, the series finale of Dark, and the mystery of Original Sin. just finished watching the Netflix show uh, Dark, and I have to say I am just overflowing with thoughts, feelings, theories, uh, everything else in between. It was a masterful ending to a masterfully written show. Uh, that much, I have to say, is true for me. Uh, in fact, I would say that Dark is the greatest sci-fi series I've ever seen. Uh, it's written with a sense of wonder and suspense that I have not seen in recent years, other than maybe Blade Runner 2049 which is just a, a singular story that builds off of the original Blade Runner. Uh, but either way, I mean, it's it's a show that has really inspired me to finish my second book. Oh, oh wait, what's it called again? The Shadow of Mars? Oh, yes, yes, there actually is a second book in my sci-fi series that I just I keep putting off and putting off and putting off. And if only I could travel through time like they do in Dark, maybe I could, you know, convince myself to finally finish it or, or something. But... <laughs> It'll, it'll be there. It's coming. It's coming. But anyway, uh, you know, enough of my own lamenting. Uh, Dark is a real treasure of imagination. Uh, this episode I'm doing is going to be heavy with spoilers. So if you don't want anything ruined for yourself, just please do not listen in to the rest of this episode. Uh, instead, go and watch the rest of Dark and then listen in. Uh, so you've been warned. You have been warned. Uh, but of course, if you want to, you could let this play on the background on mute. Uh, return on another platform and boost my listens. I mean, you always have that option, right? Uh, so, uh, hey, that's entirely up to you. I'm not trying to coerce you in any way or whatnot, but I'm just just saying that's an option. That is an option for you, my listener, as something you could do here. So, anyway, quick recap on Dark. Since I literally did an episode uh, on the show about 10 episodes back, that's just how good this, this show is. Uh, this is the culmination of the Dark series on Netflix with this third season. So it's almost like a trilogy of seasons. The first two, uh, just again, to bring us back up to speed and see where I'm going with this in this episode, is it's about time travel. There's a kidnapping. The, a young boy is taken in the year 2019. And uh, we end up finding out that there's a cave next to a power plant. And you can travel 33 years into the past or 33 years into the future. It's referred to uh, mostly as the God Particle. It's something that opens up a window into the past, or like I said, into the future. And from there, it creates all of these strange paradoxes where people travel in the past, they're affecting the future, uh, people in the future are affecting the past, and it just seems like one giant big loop that is 
impossible to get out of. And so season three is really the the moment where they're going to, uh, you know, I guess tie up all the loose ends. And we get introduced at the end of season two to a parallel universe where there is a second version of one of the main characters whose name is Martha. And she saves Jonas from what is known as the apocalypse, which is when the the you know sort of the god particle goes out of control it blows up inside the town it destroys everything uh in the town of Winden and she rescues the main character Jonas um from the impending apocalypse and then we're told that you know she's not from <clears throat> a certain time it's from where she's from which is a parallel parallel world and naturally this is what this is what really piqued my interest as to how they were going to handle this in season three. And as I've said before, they did a fantastic job. So, so season three really picks up right where the other left off. You know, like I said, it's a visit from another Martha. She saves Jonas. They transport to a parallel world to Jonas's. And from there, we start to see how the knot or the loop is going to be untied in the series. Uh, again, Jonas is on the run from Adam, who is his elderly self, who is the main antagonist of the series. He's the very uh, beat-up, scarred-looking guy who leads the uh, sort of cult-like group called Sigmundus, which is trying to close the loops and end time travel forever. Meanwhile, younger Jonas is trying to avoid this fate throughout uh, Season 2 and, of course, now into Season 3 and uh, but, but now he has this parallel Martha to deal with. And I've seen this idea done in other shows uh, where we have a, a, you know sort of a mainline world and there's a parallel one. The show Fringe is one that came to mind when I saw this, uh, when I first sat down to watch season three. And Fringe, if you don't remember, was a, was a semi-popular show about a decade ago, I think. It toyed with this idea of parallel universes. Uh, I think it was somewhat successful in its execution of the concept. Uh, but Dark, uh, this series takes the idea and just just sort of turns it on its head and blows it up into even bigger territory uh, in a really really good way. Uh, it it starts to explain how we may have splinter universes, but they don't necessarily have to play out the same way over and over again, especially because of the loop. And like I said before, the characters in Dark are, are sort of trapped by their own fates. You know, there's this idea of predeterminism that because they've met their elder selves, they know they're going to survive. But Dark never really indulges the idea that nobody's in danger. It instead indulges the idea that everyone's bound by their fate. Everyone's bound by choices. Everyone's bound by sort of their innate desires, which of course is going to play into this concept of original sin that uh, we're going to get into here uh, before I get ahead of myself. But that's what's so interesting <clears throat> excuse me, about Dark is that it plays with these ideas of fate, free will, predeterminism, and now introducing a parallel world, we, we have a place where choices are happening very similarly, even though the characters are different, even though they're from another universe, they're still behaving in relatively the same way, which again reinforces the idea that we're just, you know, we're bound to the choices that we make and we're we're almost predetermined in some way to keep doing the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> so in the midst of this, we are introduced to a new character. Her name is Ava, and she is the Adam to Jonas or, or Martha's Jonas. I think I said that right. She's basically Martha, who is Jonas's love interest from the first two seasons, who is dead now at the end of the second season, but her parallel version is alive. Uh, Martha's elderly self in the second universe is goes by the name of Ava. Um, so in much the same way as I said, we have an older version of Jonas who becomes Adam. We now have an older version of Martha who becomes Ava. And Ava leads another group called Eret Lux, which is basically like the light, is, is, is what the, uh, uh, the group that she leads. And, of course, she leads a group that is mostly other time travelers. Uh, we were introduced to the character Claudia Tiedemann, her elder self in the last season. She's part of that group trying to undo the knot, supposedly. 
But as we find out in this season, Ava is not exactly a good guy either. She's manipulating all the events so that people can live their lives, so that Adam doesn't screw things up, so that he doesn't end both you know both worlds, the what is considered to be Jonas's world and then the the parallel Martha's world. She's trying to keep everything in play and keep the loop the way that it is, uh, so that everyone can still live, even though it's it you know even though it's sort of kind of like a trapped universe where you can't get out of the choices you make. And this is where I think the idea of original sin is introduced in the show and the allusions to these biblical characters comes in full force. Because obviously, if you have a character named Adam and you have a character named Ava, I mean, that's close enough to Eve, right? <laughs> that we pretty much get the idea uh, that uh, we are playing around with those biblical characters. And not only that, there's a... Uh, I think one of the first or second episodes of the third season, Ava is explaining to Jonas about this concept of Adam and Eve and how their fates are intertwined. And there's this mural up of Adam and Eve, um, uh, this pictorial that was burned at one point and then it's it's still alive in another universe. And we see uh, Adam and Eve's depiction on this uh, on this wall, on this painting. And... Again, this is a straight allusion to the biblical characters, to Adam and Eve. So the elder characters, Adam and Ava, are sort of like the ones uh, catalyzing all the events. They're the ones that are causing all the people within the loops uh, to play out the way they do. They're manipulating events. They're the leaders of their respective groups, the light and the shadow. Dark does this brilliantly with these character names and with this with these illustrations to give us the impression that Adam and Ava, like the biblical characters, are responsible solely for all of the pain and the suffering of the other characters that they come into contact with. And that's the big reveal at the end of this series, is that Adam and Ava, having created these groups of time travelers and fighting against each other, have somewhat directly and even indirectly caused every other person that they run into to suffer in the way that they have suffered throughout their lives, trying to control the time-traveling um, component. And like many who have read through the biblical account, I don't know if you have, listener, but I have, Adam and Eve really get a raw deal, don't they? I mean, it seems as though that, you know, we've never met them, I've never met them, but somehow they were given this paradise, they were given this perfect world where God himself is is communing with them daily, he's walking with them in the cool of the day, it says in, in, in Genesis and yet they still fall from grace. I mean, they have everything. I mean, they're, you know, as a guy, you know, as Adam, and he's there with his wife, there's no other women around. It's just him and her. She's naked. He's naked. I mean, could you ask for anything better? I mean, come on. Let's just, let's just be honest here, guys. So, so, and you're walking around, and you can eat from anywhere but this one tree. Why on earth would you ever tempt yourself enough to, to eat from it. I and mean, when God was like, look, do not eat from this, okay? You, you will surely die if you eat from this tree. Don't do it. Now, of course, there's a lot of philosophical and, you know, theological components that come into play. Why would God create a tree that you're not supposed to eat from if he knew that you were going to in the first place? And uh, I guess we could go into that at a later date. But if just to sum up real quick, it's all about right to rule more than anything, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm God. You're not, you know, these are, there are certain parameters you have to follow. And this is one of them, you know, so that's just a really, really condensed version. So, but anyway, uh, where were we on this? Okay. But it, it just seems to me that when we hear the Genesis story, we always think like, okay, if, if this is true, if it is true that God had two human beings made from dust and they had this beautiful garden, and everything was was grand, and God had this perfect communion with human beings. And these two people broke that that fellowship by eating of the fruit, by listening to the serpent, a.k.a. Satan, and <clears throat> falling from grace, being forced out of the garden forever, never to return. What? How can the rest of us, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years later, be held responsible for those for this just one simple action. How is it possible that we have to be held accountable for that? I mean, it just it doesn't seem fair, does it? It's like, look, I was brought into this world, I didn't do anything wrong, and yet I'm inheriting the mistake of the very first two human beings that God Himself made. 
It's not like I made these people. Look, look, that seems really, really grossly unfair to me. How could we possibly inherit this bad choice? I mean, shouldn't we be given a clean slate whenever we're born to start over again, make a better life, all these kinds of things? And this idea of the ripple effect, this idea of every choice having consequences, even if by one person or, or many, is what I think Dark is really grappling with in this third season is that it may just be one simple action. It may just be one simple thing we've set a person upon or something that we've done, but it can have this ripple effect. Now, I know this this might sound like butterfly effect type stuff, like a butterfly flaps its wings and a hurricane appears over the Pacific Ocean or something like that, but it, to me, seems incredibly true of anything that we do in life, that there is causality to some degree that if I act in some way, then I'm going to affect another person, and that person might be affected in the way that I've acted, and therefore they will, re, uh, you know, they will respond to another person in kind because of the way that I acted. So there, it, this is a revolving door uh, of people acting a certain way, coming back in, acting another way, coming back in, uh, and it just goes on and on and on. And it really gives a good argument, I think, to people who believe in predeterminism or who might say that, hey, we're just a bunch of you know, bones and, and blood and, and uh, you know, we're just a bag of bones walking around with our DNA telling us what to do all the time and just reacting to everything. We're not actually this higher being that has free will. We're really just sort of acting out on our impulses and that's it, which I think is a very crude way to look at it. Uh, but But that's what a lot of people think and that's what Dark is really exploring. Do we have the ability to change our fate? Do we have the ability to change the ripple effect. Can we stop that from happening? And so the one area where Dark actually deviates from the biblical narrative, now there's a lot of biblical allusions in the story, and Adam and Eve being the two biggest ones, or the characters being the two biggest ones, uh, Adam and Eve collectively just being the singular biggest one. The fact that Jonas and Martha, the younger Jonas and Martha, so Jonas from the from the primary world that we've been watching for the first two seasons and Martha from the, the parallel universe, are given responsibility to go back to the quote-unquote origin world and stop the catalytic moment where time travel is invented. Because that's what this is all about, stopping the origin event from happening so that the knot can be untied and that they don't have to live through these loops of predeterminism and going back in time, forward, all, etc., the fact that they're given responsibility to stop it is not something that biblically is true. So that's where the biblical illusion, illusions end. Like Adam and Eve are not responsible for coming back into our time period and uh, somehow undoing the the sinful act of taking the fruit from the from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, that's that's not true to the biblical narrative. But in Dark, that's what the characters are asked to do. Adam who is Jonas, but much older, receives a revelation from Claudia, one of the time travelers, that, look, you don't know what the true origin is. Adam thought the origin, again, this is speaking in the Dark series, the true origin was his unborn child with Parallel Universe Martha, so he kills Parallel Universe Martha, <clears throat> believing that this will end the loop forever. It doesn't, of course, and he's left wondering, well, what happened? Well, Claudia figures it out. And she tells him, look, there was an origin world, and we are two worlds that have splintered off from it because of the choices of the origin world. Pretty crazy, right? Okay, so, so pretty pretty nuts. Uh, but it's, it's all fascinating to me as a, as a sci-fi junkie. But anyway, older Adam realizes this, that it's true, and he goes to a point in time to take young Jonas with younger Martha and tells them, hey, you guys have to undo this. Like, you're the only ones who are capable of doing this. You know, I can't go back in time to do it. I have my own uh, role to play out right now in this story. Uh, you have to go stop this from happening, which, of course, they do. Jonas and Martha end up going to the origin moment, which is where the original time travel creator, Tanhouse, was creating a time travel device because his son and uh, daughter-in-law and, and, and granddaughter die in a car accident. Instead, Jonas and Martha show up as like guardian angels, stop uh, the son Merrick from running his car off the road in a storm. He goes back to stay with his father and the time travel element never happens in the quote unquote origin world, which again is projected as the place where things can happen the best 
way possible. The other two worlds, Jonas's and Parallel Universe Martha, are we following along at home? I hope you're still following along. Their splinter world is a less than good world. It's a world where there's constant suffering, where there's time travelers, where there's knots and there's loops and there's predeterminism and all this other kind of stuff. So Dark to me ends on this note of the origin world where we don't try to play God, where we don't try to travel back in time and alter events that have already happened is the best possible world where we still have our free will about us, where we don't know the future necessarily, and we instead leave that up in God's hands. We are still behaving uh, out of perhaps our, our impulses or perhaps our desires, but now we're not facing them prematurely. We're not facing them down as though we're trapped by them. We still have an open horizon for ourselves to walk into and move into. And that's kind of what the the ending scene of Dark is like, is that you have all the characters who are no longer affected by the time travelers sitting around at a dinner party, talking about their lives, or having a good time. Granted, it's not the Garden of Eden, but there's this idea that there is at least peace for these people that have been uh, so adversely affected by the time travel. And now in the origin world, now that the other two worlds have been destroyed and have disintegrated and the splinter worlds don't exist, the quote-unquote origin world is still left up to the wills of the ones that live there. They can still move forward in some way. And, uh, you know, even though I think people have all kinds of theories about what that means or anything else, if I'm looking at it at least through my lens as a storyteller and as someone who at least studies the biblical narrative, this is where the idea of paradise comes in, is that we still have free will, we still have free reign to make choices, and we're not bound by anything necessarily. We can still make good uh, good choices and a better life for ourselves. And again, that's what I think Dark is really exploring in this, and this concept of the ripple effect of original sin. The fact that two people can be held responsible for generation upon generation of sin and destructive behavior and all these kinds of things. That's what the first two seasons, and even most of season three is about in Dark, is that every single character, regardless if they're created because of the, the time traveling element or not, or if they're made, or if they're one of the original characters, Jonas or Martha or whatever, there's even a moment where Martha is explained to that no matter what happens, she will always choose what's best for herself or for her, her unborn child. And this leads us into the conclusion that as long as we're constantly following our selfish desires, as long as we are following what's best for us, innately best for us, and we we only have ourselves uh, as the primary driver of what we want in life, we're always going to have that ripple effect of pain and suffering because always acting out of selfish interest, that's sin. Okay, that's, that's actual sinful behavior, and that's the nature of people. Now, again, this is coming from my own biblical worldview that we all have sin nature, you know, again, thanks to Adam and Eve. But this is true whether or not you believe in the Bible or not. I mean, it, it, we always discover that if we are constantly acting in a selfish manner, it ends up becoming self-destructive. As long as we elevate ourselves in some way, that we're the center of the universe, we end up leading a very small life, even though we... we we think we are the sun or we think we're the center of the of, of everything, we end up having a very small livelihood because we've not really become a part of other people's lives in the way that maybe we think we have. We're just trying to manipulate other people or we're trying to get what's best for ourselves. And I, I know a lot of folks would say, well, this is the difference between being immature and being mature. Well, what is maturity? Maturity is realizing there's more people than yourself. And spiritual maturity is having long-term righteous thinking in a sense that I'm not only not the center of the universe, but there's other people who do believe that and therefore need your help. They need your help to understand that they aren't the center of the universe. And again, we could go down the route of how to best do that and all other kinds of things. Uh, but I think Jesus had a pretty good handle on that. So if you ever want to read up on on how to do that well, uh, he, has some, he has some pretty good words on that. <laughs> so anyway, but, but yes... This concept of original sin, the ripple effect, the the fact that uh, two characters can cause all of these things, Dark presents this illustration so beautifully. And I wish that there were more sort of uh, Christian underlining 
uh, perhaps Christian artists who are better at illustrating these things. Granted, I'm trying to get there myself, who are just better at, at doing art this way. I, I don't even know if the writers of Dark are necessarily Christians, even though they use a lot of imagery and uh, allusions to Christianity throughout everything that they've done. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if they are or not, and I haven't done enough research on them to, to know for sure. Granted, there are some moments in Dark and some cinema or, uh, not cinematography, some moments in Dark that I would say, well, I'm not real sure if a Christian filmmaker uh, would put that in there, as there, there, there are some pretty violent moments. Um, and I don't want to say violence is the key to that, but maybe some sexual moments, which doesn't, it isn't too distracting. It is not necessarily glorified, but at the same time, I, this is me putting on my, perhaps putting on my prude glasses and going, I'm not so sure if I agree with that. But anyway, uh, I don't know if they are Christians or not, I guess is the bottom line. I don't know if they are. But uh, but these these elements that they use, these themes that they use in the story are just fantastic and really put on display this this idea of our choices affecting so many others and then the need to undo them in some way uh, in order to get to a better, better life. And that's another thing I, I'm in favor of. I'm definitely in favor of people taking responsibility for their actions. I mean, we need to be able to do that. That speaks of maturity as well. Uh, so, so there you have it. But, but without any more drabble or, or dribbling on, that is my analysis of Dark as now that season three is finished, has come and gone. Uh, what a wonderfully written show. I mean, this is definitely the best sci-fi series I've ever, I've ever encountered. And it's with time travel. And normally I hate time travel. I don't like time travel. But this was done just absolutely brilliantly. So uh, if you have not watched Dark yet, I highly encourage it. Do not watch it with small children around. There is some some violent stuff. There is also some sexuality in there or sexual content uh, that you don't want uh, young people being exposed to necessarily. Uh, but other than that, great themes, great story. And like I said, I'm very much appreciative of how they pulled a lot of these things together. So hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and I will be back again with another analysis probably in the next couple weeks or so. As I've been dialing back on the writer's lens, I've been trying to gear up the narrative wars on my other podcast. So if you have not checked out the narrative wars yet and you want to talk about cultural things that, or want to hear about cultural things and talk about them, I mean, you're always free to write me. Find me at my website at jclfalto.com, jclfalto.com, and let me know about... Uh, what you'd like to discuss over there in the Nerd Wars or here on the Writer's Lens. So just let me know. But as always, self, the uh, same with self-promotion. Like, share, subscribe, share it with a friend, anyone you might think would be interested in the podcast. And I'll catch up with you guys again soon. This is Josh ACL Felto for the Writer's Lens.